Well, good morning and uh, welcome again to St. John. It is great to be here with you this morning. Special warm welcome to all of our guests and visitors. I'm just really glad you're here with us this morning as we dig into God's Word. And we are going to do that. But first, I want to share with you our mission statement here at, at St. John. And you, uh, you may have seen this mission statement around the church on different things, or perhaps you haven't. And if so, uh, that's, the, that's a problem. We really need to get that mission statement out. People need to know about it. I want you to know about it. And so I want to talk about it this morning. And just so you know, before I show it to you, I love this mission statement. It's one of the reasons I came here. This mission statement, we had it before I got here. It's one of the things that attracted me to St. John. So here, here goes. You ready for it? To connect our neighbors to true riches in Jesus. All right? It's Christ-centered. It's short. It's obvious. Although there may be a couple of parts of it that need a little bit more deeper explanation. For instance, what do we really mean by true riches? And who exactly are we talking about when we say our neighbor? And why do we choose the word connect? Because, you know, there's about a dozen different words we could put in there. Tell, share, you know, whatever. But why did we use the word connect? And so I, I want to talk about those three things this morning. We're going to start with true riches. And, and maybe the best way to understand what we mean by true riches is to talk about what it's not. It's not false riches. So perhaps you recognize this woman's face. She was born into poverty. Today she's worth over five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. Her name is Melinda Gates and she was married to Bill Gates. I say was because she was divorced a few years ago and in the settlement she walked away with five billion dollars. Now uh, don't feel too bad for Bill. He's already worth, uh, still worth 122 billion right? 122 billion. Uh, of course, that still pales by comparison to the next guy that we're going to look at. This is Jeff Bezos. He's the founder of Amazon, and he's worth a cool $140 billion. $140 billion. And maybe you're aware that uh, Amazon stock has gone down a little bit over the past few months. And so uh, the, the, the poor guy has lost, get this, lost $25 billion since Christmas. How about that? How would you like to lose $25 billion since Christmas, right? But uh, don't feel too sorry for him. It has not impacted his lifestyle at all. He's still worth $140 billion. Now, this next lady, she was married to Jeff Bezos. Her name is Mackenzie Scott, and she also uh, divorced him a few years ago and walked away with a cool $32 billion, Right? which means that, uh, I don't know, Melinda Gates should have found a better lawyer. I don't know, only $5 billion? What? Uh, and, and, and then there's the guy at the top of the list, you, right? You probably know the world's richest person, Elon Musk. He's worth $225 billion. Almost $100 billion more than the number two person on the list. A quarter of a trillion dollars. I, so I, I did the math, right? I, I found out uh, Elon is 50 years old, right? 50 years old. I figure if he lives another 35 years, that would place him above average for life expectancy of a man in, in the United States of America. If he lives another 35 years, that comes out to about 12,000 days, right? I did the math. 225 billion divided by 12,000 comes out to 19 million dollars a day, right? He's got to spend $19 million a day, every day for the rest of his life to spend that money or his heirs will get it. Speaking of his heirs, uh, one of his daughters came out recently saying she no longer wants anything to do with him. She does not consider him her father. She's changed her name. She doesn't want the money. She wants nothing. So um, I think that says something. Now, I don't know what, but it says, it says something and, uh, but stay tuned because we'll see if she still wants nothing to do with him after he passes away and the inheritance is on the table, right? We'll see, right? From Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves 
take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? That's the top 1% favorite Bible passage for today. Uh, Elon Musk, along with the rest of these people we've been talking about, is worth uncountable, unimaginable riches. But he has, by all accounts, forfeited his soul. I, I, I don't know. I, I, far be it for me to judge any human being and, and, and their heart and their soul and their faith and their relationship with God. But certainly from what I can tell, he has not given us any evidence, not a single clue, not a shred of a hint that he is a believer, a disciple of Jesus Christ. He has forfeited his soul. Oh, okay, the, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, these people we've been talking about do give uh, a lot of money to charity, right? Especially Bill and Melinda Gates. They, they uh, are very generous and they're, they're kind of famous for their philanthropy. But remember this verse here that Jesus said. He said, whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's, it's better to give one dollar in the name of Jesus than to give a billion dollars in your own name. Right? So it's easy for us to sit here, right, and, and point fingers at billionaires, right? But that's not why we come to church. We come to church for self-reflection. And so let's do some self-reflection. And so I had some questions. Let me ask you. Is the accumulation of wealth the driving goal of your life? Right? Is comfort and luxury and the pursuit of, of wealth the great project of your life? in some way, shape, or form? Did you find yourself fantasizing about what it would be like to spend $19 million a day? Or were you fantasizing about the rewards that Jesus will give to every believer in eternity? And if the answer to any of those questions, right, and, and certainly for me, when I, when I reflect, you know me, I, I preach to myself first and then uh, everybody else second. When, when, if, so if, if you're like me and you listen to those questions and you think, well, geez, to a certain extent, you know, maybe that's true. Well, you are forgiven, right? But we're starting to get an idea of what we really mean by the difference between true riches and false riches, right? When we talk about true riches, we're talking about eternal life and salvation, right? Those are true riches in Jesus, eternal life and salvation. And we tend to get these two things kind of um, uh, conflated, if they're the same thing. And they're, they're very close to the same thing, but they, they're a little bit different. Eternal life is really, we're talking about the future. We're talking about after you die and are resurrected to live forever in the new kingdom for eternity, right? That's, that's eternal life. But salvation, closely related, but it's a little bit different. Salvation, it, when we talk about salvation, we're talking about salvation from sin and all of its consequences, both direct and indirect, the fact that we live in a sinful, broken world. And when we experience uh, that, that salvation, when God forgives us of all of our sins because of our faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross, then it's a game changer. It, it changes our perspective 
it, it changes uh, how, uh, what, uh, you know, gives us new, new, new purpose and meaning and satisfaction in life. It gives us a new way of living, new priorities of love and service to others. It, it allows us to overcome things like addictions and destructive behaviors. It causes us to be a better person, better spouse, parent, brother, sister, friend, whatever. All because of the difference that Jesus Christ has made in our life. And, and then this new way of living, this new person that we become, and, and all these new things, it, it actually causes us to have a richer life. Not, not rich in terms of money, or wealth, comfort, or luxury, but rich in terms of things that are true and lasting. We're getting a better idea now of the difference between true riches and false riches. So why, why do we have this in our mission statement? What, what, why is that our mission, uh, part of it being true riches? Well, because we live in a community, Cypress, Texas, that is a pretty wealthy community, right? There's a lot of wealth in, in this community. There's, uh, I, I don't know if we have any people who are worth $100 billion in Cypress, Texas, but we, we, have, we, have, we have millionaires, well, a lot of them in this community. There's a lot of wealth and a lot of luxury. And, and before I go any further, I want to make one thing clear. It is not wrong to be rich in money and wealth. It's not wrong to be wealthy. If God has blessed you with wealth and material goods and, and, and wonderful things, that's wonderful. Great. God bless you. Those are blessings from God that he wants you to enjoy. But believers keep those things in perspective. Believers understand that they are not, they're, they're not real, that they are false riches. They're blessings, but they're, they're not to be pursued at all costs. And that there are more important things to pursue and, and, and base our lives on. The problem is that there's a lot of people in our community who live on our streets, in our neighborhoods, who go to work in our offices, who we stand in line with us at the post office or the grocery store. And people who have, uh, are deceived about what riches really are. People who think that, that, that false riches, materialism and, and wealth are, are the things that bring meaning and purpose to life. Uh, they're the things that, that bring security to life, that make people feel like they're, they're going to be okay in the future. And people put a lot of, a lot of stock in, in these false riches. They're being deceived on a daily basis. Meanwhile, we know the truth. We're not perfect, but we, we're, we're, we know the truth. And we're pursuing it. And our job, our mission, is to connect them to it. Right? That's our mission, to connect our neighbors to true riches of Jesus. So you're starting to get an idea also what we mean by neighbors. Right? Because I know that there's a, a parable in the Bible where Jesus talks about uh, neighbor. He defines the word neighbor as meaning anyone who's in need. And that is absolutely true. But for the purposes of our mission statement, the word neighbor specifically means the people we live near, the people we share a fence with, the people who are across the street, the people who live in our neighborhood, in our HOA, the people who work in our office, who are uh, uh, in, our, in our social group. These are our neighbors, the people who we, we, we rub shoulders with. And it's our job to connect them. And so we want to um, talk a little bit more about this word connecting. Why do we choose the word connect instead of tell or share or whatever that, that, that uh, we could have we have chosen? You see, tell is it's very temporary, and, uh, and I don't know if it really does the entire job. For instance, if we were to say that, that our mission is to tell people about true riches in Jesus, then your job— Right, as a member of St. John, would be to learn how to articulate everything I've said in the past 10 minutes and be able to say it at least as well, hopefully better than I've said it, to everyone you know. Right? Your job would just be this giant megaphone to tell people 
about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you, your job would be to swallow hard and just tell them, even if you're uncomfortable and it would, it would come with guilt and pressure and be difficult. And if there's one thing you know about me, I don't like guilt and pressure. I don't think that has any point in religion. Instead, when we say that our job is to connect them, then it's all about relationships and going through life together. And it's about something that is no pressure and no guilt. It's just connecting people. Or another way to look at it, if we, if we, if we use tell, well, you be on your own, right? It's your, just your job to go out and just tell people on your own. Uh, but if we use the word connect, that has this sense that you're a part of a community, a team, that St. John is this, this team where we work together to connect people. Or if we said, another way to look at it, if we said uh, tell, right? If your job was to tell, then your, your job would be to be at your back fence or your front door or other people's front door talking to them about Jesus and hoping they don't slam the door in your face, right? And, and that's something that, that very few people are really able to do successfully. In fact, in America in 2022, I don't think that, that model really works. But connecting people, that gives us this image of us together, all of us working together, using whatever gifts God has given us, whatever gifts God has given you and you and you and you and you, and working together to invite our neighbors to come and experience true riches. Jesus once told a story, a parable, about a farmer who went out to sow his seed. And the seed rooted and, and, and it started to grow. And at the end of the story, there's this giant harvest of people who come into God's kingdom. When I, when I read that story, I think of our mission statement. Our mission statement is to sow that seed, to be the farmer in that, in that story. So imagine for a moment a family, a family who comes to our church for the first time. And I don't know, maybe they, maybe they were invited by a friend, right, because that friend sowed seeds. Or maybe they came for the first time to uh, an event like tons of trucks, and they had a great time, and, and they thought it was just going to be a couple hours spent, but then they, they, they saw that what a great church we have, and, and they decide to, you know, maybe come back and, and worship sometime on a Sunday. That means that all the people who worked so hard to put on that event were really sowing seeds. Or maybe it was through our ECC, our, 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 our uh, early childhood center, where people came in because they wanted a good preschool for their kids, but because of the people who love and work so hard in our ECC, those seeds are sown. Or maybe it's because they heard we have great children's and youth programs, and so they want to be a part of that. And seeds are sown. And then they come into our church for the first time, the first Sunday morning, and they come through the door, and they're greeted by someone with a big warm smile and a handshake, and that person tells them that, you know, hey, we're glad you're here. And the seeds begin to grow. And they come and they, they worship with us. And that worship is fulfilling to their soul. And they want to come back. And they, 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 they start to grow and understand God's promises. And, the, and, 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 and that's only possible because of the many, many people who work so hard every Sunday to make our worship services happen. Not just our staff, but our musicians and our tech people, our greeters, ushers, elders, altar guild, all kinds of different people who make this happen. Here at St. John, we call that celebrate, and the seeds grow. And then that family gets to be more involved. They start going to Bible study and put their kids in Sunday school and youth programs. And here at St. John, we call that live, living in biblical community. We use the word live, and, and it's only possible because of all of the people that work so hard in our children's and youth programs and our Bible study leaders. And that seed begins to grow. And then that family decides, well, hey, you know, we want to get more involved and we want to start serving others ourselves. And so they take that, that flyer, that wraparound that you got this morning, and they check some of those boxes and they get involved 
and they start serving others here at St. John. Here at St. John, we call that serve. And the seeds grow more. And then that family begins to reach out and join our efforts to reach out into the community and help the needy and to, to invite people in and, and, and to reach the lost. And here at St. John, we call that share. And it takes a lot of people to make that happen. All of those people contributing to that faith growth and that maturity of that family. And that story happens over and over and over here again at St. John. And I bet that many of you are thinking right now, you know, I, I'm, I, that, that's kind of my story. In some way, shape, or form, my, my story it relates to that as well a, a lot too. And some of you may say, well, you know, I'm, I'm right at the beginning of that story. And I want that to be my story. And it happens over and over and over again at St. John. And every single one of us, all we have to do is do what God has called us to do. All we have to do is use the gifts that God has given us to do at St. John. We don't have to do everything. We don't have to be knocking on doors. We just have to do what God has brought us here at St. John to do. And then when that happens, God has brought all the people together, and it works. And we, as a team, as a church, fulfill our mission to connect our neighbors to true riches in Jesus. And our Heavenly Father rejoices in His harvest. 